This episode of Floor John Lander includes conversation about sexual violence that some listeners may find distressing. Support resources are available from RAIN.org, including a confidential helpline for those in the U.S. That's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Welcome to Lord John Lander, the Outlander podcast for Lord John fans, where we talk about all things Outlander, but especially about Jamie and his Sassanac. And sometimes we talk about Claire, too. For however long it takes, we'll lead you on a journey so chaotic, you'll question every life choice that led you to be here today. And like the Hotel California, you can check out any time, but you can never leave. We may not be the Outlander podcast you wanted, but we will be the Outlander podcast you didn't know you needed. Now, before we get into it, this is your one and only warning that show and book spoilers are lurking around every corner. We're going to spoil stuff from future seasons, future books, and our own brains. Remember, if you can't prove our headcanon didn't happen, then we can only assume that it did. If you make it through the episode in one piece, we'd love to hear from you. Send us your burning questions, wild theories, thick prompts, flattering compliments, or whatever's on your mind. You can contact us on Twitter and Tumblr at Lord John Lander or on our website at lordjohnlander.wordpress.com, where you'll also find our archived episodes, teasers, thick wrecks, and more. Hello, welcome to Lord John Lander. We are your hosts. I'm Mistress Pandora. You can call me Pan because that's still a mouthful. And I'm Beth. Uh, so we have, we're on episode 2.03, um, which is useful occupations and deceptions. We made it, we kind of mentioned doing like clarifications last week um, about the connection to Eaton. Did John have a connection to Eaton? And we did a quick little search like just now and couldn't find anything super readily. So that may have to wait until season five. So you'll forget about it. And so will we. And that's okay. And I, it's possible I might have had something too, but I haven't had a chance to listen to the full recording yet from last week. So um, yeah, if you know what, maybe I'll clarify it next episode. Maybe I won't. Who knows? So we like to keep you on your toes. This is what we do. So um I just mentioned this to Beth before we hit record, but watching my my initial impression of this episode was it was so boring. I'm just going to I'm just going to own it. <laughs> well, it was so funny because last week I don't think it was on the episode. I think it was when we were just chatting like before the episode or in the group chat or whatever. Um I think like you and Ness were both saying like season, the first half of season two is boring. And I'm like, I'm thinking like, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's got like the great Jamie hair. Um, It's got like some spying shit and like whatever. And it's got Versailles. I don't know if, if I can trust myself anymore. Also so much didn't happen. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. I would like to give a shout out real quick to um levy squeaks who was intending to join us as our guest host this week but was not able to swing it due to a scheduling conflict so when we get when we get introduced to fergus towards the end of the episode his absence will be sorely missed so just wanted to say love you levy we miss you and we'll get to do this some other time and it's going to be even worse chaos than it normally is it's going to be even worse it's going to be worse (laughs) in a good way in a good way. Uh, I know. I was really uh, looking forward to having, you know, somebody else to to beef this episode up a little. But, you know, we'll, we'll make do. We'll make do. So we've got some, uh, a whole bunch of not much happens. Like, even even the, sh- the synopsis from Wiki is boring. Political machinations dominate most of Jamie's time. While Claire puts her healing skills to use, their plan to stop Culloden moves along, but the forward momentum is jeopardized by past actions. Okay. That's accurate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of just... Yeah, it doesn't move forward. It does... It's kind of weird because by the end, they have made some progress, but like it doesn't feel like they've made any progress. 
But I do think it, it pays off in some of the next episodes as they start to, like, you know, figure shit out a little more. Or maybe it doesn't because, well, I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. I always, the Paris episodes all blend together for me. Um, and I just like never, it's weird for me actually to be watching and talking about them separately because I just, I can never, like you, I could never tell you off the top of my head, like which episode in season two did Fergus first appear. Right. And, but now I can, cause it's this episode. Well, yeah, we had to look it up. <laughs> so other than snooze fest, what were your thoughts? So Big thing is where we've got the return of Laird Dumbass. Okay. Oh he's a bit more subdued and he's kind of even annoyed with himself. Like he knows he's got to like play the role of Lord Laird Dumbass. But also like, even though he's kind of like playing that role to do the spying stuff, he kind of also falls into that role. Um, you know, once like once he puts the suit on, it fits. Yeah, so it definitely, you know, a more weather worn Laird dumbass, but he's there. Um, you know, and <laughs> just kind of like the that first scene where he comes like rushing in from the carriage and like, you know, oh I stuck my head out the window to try to get rid of the smoke smell. Like, oh my God. Um, of course, so it made me think like some things never change over time, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, yeah, so so Lear Dumbass is back, but it's kind of like, okay, we've done this before. You're right, though. He does really fall into this role of being a spy. It's like he just he's incapable of half-assing anything, which, okay, props. Yeah. But that applies to so much. It applies to being Lear Dumbass. It applies to well, when he feels like being a raging dick, it applies to that, too. And uh, we didn't really get a whole lot of that this episode. He's kind of a dick. Yeah, well, he was a little bit of a dick. Yeah. I mean, he's like, first of all, he's going on and on like, oh, I've got to go back and play chess. And then I've got to go hang out at the brothel again. And then I got to do. And I'm like, oh, OK, like, OK, I get you're tired and don't really like the spy <laughs> shit, but like. Your pregnant wife has to go sit with these uh, really women and women. just have tea. So can you, like, calm down? And then <laughs> I'm skipping ahead a little, but, like, when Claire comes home, when he comes home and Claire's not there, and then she, then she comes in later, and she's like, I'm here to help you. And he's like, so I believed. Like, holy shit, Jamie. I'm down. <laughs> it's, it's, he gets an Oscar for that. And I don't mean Sam. I mean, Jamie. Like, <laughs> we get it. You are lonely. Okay. Like, you're going to make her have, make you a sandwich too? Like, come on. Um, <laughs> But that's Laird Dumbass, right? Like, that is just 100% yeah. Laird Dumbass. So... It's definitely an immature version of Jamie that is almost weird to see after season four, five, and six. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, which, by the way, somebody, there was a picture posted on Twitter. I don't think I downloaded it. I should have. Um, of them, like, filming something in season seven. I don't know where it came from. But Ooh. Oh no, it was, no, I'm sorry. It was the, it was the video that Sam posted on the set or something. I can't remember what it was. There were a couple things, but anyway, they got Jamie looking pretty old um, for season seven. I was like, damn. He's been through it. <laughs> he has, he has that guy, you know? What is that Indiana Jones quote? It's not the age, it's the miles. <laughs> I like that quote. That's a good quote. Anywho, um, yeah, Laird dumbass. We also now have the Frank paradox. Yes, one. It's just one of those things that like drives me nuts, right? So the if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Frank paradox is the fact that you know Claire remembers that Mary Hawkins was listed as 
her and Jack Randall were listed as the parents of Frank's ancestor. So all of a sudden now, Claire's like, oh shit, if Jack Randall doesn't live for like another year, then Frank will never exist. Uh huh. And it that becomes the reason for like a lot of fucking shenanigans that I won't get into because it's in later episodes of the season. We have to have something to talk about when we get there. <laughs> yeah, but like all of a sudden this like spiraling panic that she has about this is yeah. this is that's that's what's going to set off a horrible chain of events. It's so stupid because she knew that he was her, his ancestor. She knew that Jack Randall was Frank's ancestor immediately immediately she knew and it was never a concern before right why now a whole season later why now well and i even put on the things that don't make sense and i'll just skip to that one right now oh yeah you did sorry <laughs> <laughs> she she thought he was dead already from the end of of from when they left Wentworth up mm -hmm. until this point. So it's been like, what, four, five, six months. And she hasn't thought a thing about what that means for Frank that whole time. And now, but now all of a sudden she knows Frank, uh, Blackjack Randall's alive. And now all of a sudden she's worried that if he dies, that Frank won't like what uh, it doesn't make it make sense. I can't because she had no, she gave no shits when she thought he was dead. She gave no, sh she would have killed him herself if she thought she could have. Exactly. She tried to kill him in the prison. Uh -huh. Like even bef even before the, with the cattle. I mean, yes. she, was, she, she was out for blood with him. She did not give two shits, but now all of a sudden she's going to worry about it. And I guess it's because they need this plot catalyst for stuff in future episodes. And that's really kind of annoying. It is. The only thing that I can think might make it make sense, kind of, and even then, seriously, is she didn't know, Claire did not realize until she remembered Mary Hawkins from the right. Randall Family Bible she didn't realize that they weren't already married. Okay, true. So we can, we can, as far as she knew in season one, he was already married and already had his kids. Mm, true. But there wasn't any, was there any dates on that? I guess there weren't any dates on yeah, that. Yeah, there book. weren't any dates. Or if there were, mm. she didn't remember them. I, I mean, it's a, it's a thin bag. Like it's the recycled Walmart grocery sack that's going to break and spill your beer all over the parking lot. As far as his explanations go, it does not hold water. But that's the that's the only thing I can think of. And even then, she could have drawn. I don't know. But then, why did she say he has to live for another year? He doesn't need to be around while Mary's pregnant. But that's what she said specifically. Mm -hmm. He I, needs to live another year. Yeah. So again, what the fuck? Like. So did she then maybe she did know the date. I mean, I know they didn't show the dates on the book in the show, but like, I don't know. Well, she knew his death date. She knew the day that he was supposed to die. Right. Right. And so if he makes it that long, then presumably everything would work. You know what? Mm. We're tearing ourselves up over this way more than anybody involved in the actual production of this. Uh <laughs> As happens. If we were running the show, things would make a lot more sense because we actually, we care, okay? We care about the logic. We do it for you guys. Also, it would be way gayer. Oh, of course. Clearly. So yeah, Frank Paradox. But we also have Lady Dumbass. Yes. Yes. Claire is, you know, and we talked about this last week, how the fact that in the show, Claire and Jamie aren't having sex, um, kind of makes it seem like all of Claire's shitty mood is 
because she's just this like sex deprived whatever Mm -hmm. um so yeah so the impression that we get is that claire is sex deprived and bored um which i don't think is doing her character enough service to be honest Mm -mm. you know i think sometimes and this is just a tiny tangent but you know i think sometimes when i complain about stuff with claire it's because i want more from claire or different from claire than what the show or the author gives us um and this is a perfect example yeah absolutely absolutely she's unique as a as far as female leads go she's uniquely positioned to be able to do more and yet doesn't yeah but yeah so first she was mad so last episode remember she was mad that the servants like wouldn't leave her alone but now she's mad that Suzette took a break and didn't mend her whatever the fuck that was it's just like some piece of lace I'm like I is that like that's is that serious? panties is that like yeah like did you really need that just now so she goes busting in on uh suzette and myrta taking a little break for themselves which they deserve uh, yeah give myrta something to do well and she even said she said don't you have anything better to do and he's like no <laughs> <laughs> everybody okay it speaks such volumes that everybody in this episode is fucking bored like the characters are bored (laughs) that's not a good sign (laughs) i mean it totally makes sense though with the title because it's almost like ironic right like useful occupations and deceptions like is any of this useful but and then myrta i love he just absolutely calls her out like when did you become so priggish about a roll in the sheets <laughs> he is clearly the one holding their last brain cell like oh there is God. three idiots one brain cell and they left it with Murta, and he's got nothing else to do but screw the little chambermaid <laughs> i can't be mad at him for that he's got to have some sort of if he can't get mental stimulation for that one brain cell he might as well get some other stimulation well go ahead and say that i don't even think myrta belongs in the the idiots category he's ready he's he's and he's got plans he's got good ideas and he's just like flapping in the wind with the two you know laird and lady dumbass (laughs) it's their new (laughs) official titles ladies and gentlemen laird and lady dumbass (laughs) (laughs) oh my god i I do love that he calls her out on it and she kind of like, okay, so now it's revealed that she's being bitchy because she's worried about Jack being alive and blah, blah, blah. She's frustrated. That just happened like two seconds ago. I know. Oh, no, like, Jack- yeah, never mind. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Okay. Well, she's, Sorry. she's been holding on to it for a, a whole half an episode and it's killing her <laughs> because these episodes span like weeks and weeks, apparently. Oh my God. Well, she doesn't have anything better to do than stew, worry about it, yell at Suzette, poor Suzette, and then like takes poor it Suzette. upon, her, and then takes it upon herself to go get birth control for Suzette. You are really <laughs> bored, lady. Come on, good lord. Oh. But it does let us see Master Raymond and the comp, the Comte again. I weirdly like the Comte in this episode, like I. I mean, he was there for all of five seconds, but I weirdly, not this episode, this time through, I weirdly like him. I mean, I, he's I an interesting why. character. Yes. I mean, I'm not, you know, like, and I always say that there's a difference between liking, liking a character and liking a character. Right. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's definitely a, an interesting character and uh, he's really hot too. So I mean, he's Oddly. definitely easy on the eyes. It was one of those that kind of surprised me. I'm like, uh oh, I'm getting ideas. <laughs> I'm getting urges. I'm probably going to hurt him next. <laughs> Stick that in my back pocket for another day. <laughs> um, oh, not enough of him to talk about in this episode, really. But Master Ramon, can oh, Master Ramon's waistcoat, the embroidery, 
can we talk about that for a second? How amazing it was? You can. I didn't really notice it, but go didn't ahead. Notice it? Holy crap! It was good. Oh God, I was falling asleep. You were falling. You slept through the waistcoat. How could you? <laughs> it had. It it was just really elaborately embroidered, and I'm staring at it like a machine didn't do that. How did they do that? Mm. And how much did it cost? And where can I get one? It was really cool. It had like birds and things, and it had um. Not a tarot card. It had like a Buddhist symbol on it. It was very cool. Anyway, it was phenomenal and striking. And I kind of zoned out because I was just staring at the pretty waistcoat. And so I was, for a moment, I was Tom Bird. <laughs> you were like, oh, all the buttons that I have to sew back on. <laughs> I was like, the embroidery, it's so pretty. Yeah, Tom Bird would appreciate that. How's John doing? What do we think John's doing right now? I don't know. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I didn't think too much about this. Oh, actually, I do Sorry. have. No, 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 it's cool because I did have a thought and I don't think I wrote it down. Did I write it down? I didn't write it down. Um, You know what? No, pause, mm, pin it, save it for point counterpoint. Okay. I'll bring it up at the end of that. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Claire's face as she rolls up to the hospital and she's looking up like oh, the pestilence. She was so excited. Bless her heart. She hasn't been that excited since they left the Abbey. <laughs> she hasn't. She hasn't gotten to like play with pus and set bones and make people cry. She hasn't gotten to do any of that fun, really gross stuff. And there was a lot of pus in this episode. <laughs> but yeah, her face, Marta just like not having it. Like this is terrible. Marta's completely grumpy. He's really pissed. Wait in the car. And what the frick is he supposed to do? He doesn't have a book with him. Is, know, is right? he supposed to talk to people he doesn't like? What is he supposed to do? Like, give him a tablet or something. I know. She's <laughs> just like, you don't even have to go in. And I'm thinking like, but what if he wants to? There's nothing to do up there. <laughs> what the fuck is he supposed to do? I <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, right? It's just like, wait in the car. Like, for hours we were 80s kids we were left in the car so i mean what did we do when our parents locked us in the hot car while they went into the store for like an hour <laughs> i climbed into the front seat and i played with the steering wheel and pretended to drive if i was really yep, lucky they le- <laughs> if i was really lucky they left the keys in the ignition because i was also a kid in florida so they had to usually leave me with the air going because it was 8 million mm. degrees and my little brain would have melted within 30 seconds. Uh, so usually I had like the radio, but if like my grandma left yeah. me in her Oldsmobile, which incidentally I thought was called an Oldsmobile, not because of the manufacturer, but because it was that old. <laughs> that was a random thought. I have never, I have not thought that thought in 30 years. That's hilarious. <laughs> Oh my god. Although I love those little like things about like when you're a kid that you just like like I remember we were we were at a store and we were shopping for um a speedometer for my parents' bikes and um I was like, "Oh, I found it. A speedometer." <laughs> That's how I learned how to spell it and I still say thermometer when I'm trying to write it. <laughs> Wednesday. Come on. Wednesday. Everybody says that. Everybody, come on. <laughs> Wednesday. I I played with the steering wheel. What's he supposed yeah. to do? But that was like when they went to go pay for gas or something. Or would like run into Kmart and I didn't want to go and they didn't want to take me. <laughs> So you're saying I was more neglected than you. I mean, it's not a contest, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh man. Well, and I lived, you know, in New York, so it wasn't as hot. And so, and, you know, windows for the, any kids listening, you know, windows used to actually roll down. It wasn't, yeah. Like, you didn't need the, so my parents would be like, lock the doors and crack a window. Yes. That happened in the winter. <laughs> For me, it didn't really happen in the summer. In the summer, it was like, no, the AC's got to stay on or absolutely not. You can't stay in the car even with the AC going. 
or it was my job to guard the car while the car was running and the AC was on so we didn't burn our asses off when we got back in. Here, you're little. Guard the car. Yes. Made perfect sense. If anyone tries to take it, do something. <laughs> I don't know what they thought I was going to do. Beep the horn. I don't know. <laughs> Look, kids, we're all traumatized. Okay. Uh, here we are. You don't even know. Anyway, yeah. So, um, yeah. No smartphones, no tablets. If we were lucky, we had a coloring book. Um, he does not want Claire to go into this hospital. I don't blame him. He doesn't want to get left outside. And she says, Jamie will be, ha- or he'll be happy if I'm happy. Because Mert is <laughs> like, Jamie's not going to like this. And I'm like, hmm. You're, but we're talking about Laird Dumbass, not Jamie. It's the difference. They're different people. It is different. But also, I mean, Jamie was a dick about it, but he has a point. Like, she yes. literally just dipped her finger in urine and tasted it within, like, an hour of being there. Like, what? <laughs> I'm not sure what she was looking for. I assume... Like, I'm not going to go test it out, but I assume there is a slightly different flavor to urine from diabetes. Well, there's sugar in it. So it it is, it like, if it's really bad, it can have like a sweet smell. I know that. So I'm guessing you can taste the sugar in the urine. I've never tried. So not gonna. One, I don't have someone that has diabetes so that I can ask them to sample their urine. And also, no, because that's disgusting. Shot glass. Hey, fill me up. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. It's funny, though, that they used to call it the sugar sickness because, so I have, I... I have quite a history of diabetes in my family, an extended family. Uh, knock on wood, I'm good so far. Um, and they all used to call it, they never called it diabetes. They called it the sugar. Oh, yeah. Uncle Lee, he can't have that. He's got the sugar. <laughs> I've, I've heard that before. That's interesting because I heard that in the South. Well... Sometimes upstate New York is a lot like the South. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> um, yeah, but they, they always called it the sugar, never diabetes. I think the... Oh, my heart kind of broke a little for Jamie when he lost the snake. Oh, I know. Like, he's he's he was really upset about it. And, like, on the one hand, it seems kind of childish, but on the other, that is the only thing he's got of his brother. Yeah. But then he finds it again, so it's fine. He does. Do we... I'm trying to think, though. So, when he was... And I know I'm jumping ahead. It, when, if, when he was at Hellwater and he made the snake for Willie, did he have... He didn't have his Sonny then, did he? Like, did he... What, In, did he lose it at some point? Didn't he, I think, he didn't give him a snake in, I don't think he carved him a snake at Hellwater in the book. He just gave him his rosary. Right. But in the show, he carved him a snake that said Will or William or something on the back. Actually, I think, didn't it say James? Anyway. Um, um, Anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there and we'll talk about it forever and probably cry real tears. (laughs) Oh my God. That episode. Oh, Lord. Yeah, it's going to be bad. Okay. Strap in. Just get ready. But, like, I don't know if we ever find out in the show. Do we? Or do we find out in the book? What happened to Sonny? I don't remember. I Mm. think... I want to say Jenny had kept it for him. Mm. Because I don't think he took it. I don't think he took it on the road to Culloden. Yeah. Yeah, we'll find find out. Or he had it on him still. We'll find out. Or we won't. We'll, we'll, you know what? If we don't, we'll make it up. It's fine. <laughs> or we'll all forget this conversation ever happened. That's more likely. Which is <laughs> the most likely scenario here. <laughs> That's most likely. <laughs> but we do meet Fergus in this episode. Oh, well, baby. Claudel, but we both decided that wasn't a, wasn't a very manly. Wasn't a very manly. 
It's one of my favorite lines of the show. It's so oh cute. Oh, my and God. Once again, his solution is child, adopt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a there's a tag. This is only a very brief tangent, I swear. There is a tag on Tumblr that's like, all the world's cats are my cats. All the world's children are my <laughs> children, Jamie. That's not how that works. <laughs> but I love it when he approaches it with Fergus. It's like, like when a kid brings home a stray dog and the dad's like, well, you can, you can keep, we can keep it, but like, it's got to sleep in the garage. And then like two weeks later, it's like the dad's best friend and like sleeping like in the chair with him and stuff. Cause he's like, Oh, he's, he's going to be in the servants quarters, whatever. And then like, you know, then all of a sudden it's like my son. Yeah. You keep telling yourself that you don't actually want the cat. You're Okay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, dads and the animals they didn't want are like the greatest love story of our time. Every time, and they are. It's adorable. It's always it's always funny, and you can never call them on it either. No, nope. well, you can, but then they're like, oh, "You stop! Don't say that about me and my baby." <laughs> right? <laughs> I never said I didn't want it. Or they'll be like. I don't like this dumbass dog as they're like, as the dog's like draped across their lap and they're just like petting it and feeding it like steak. Right. <laughs> the dog suddenly eats better than the kids. Anyway. Yes. um, So this, there is some changes that they made. There's some things from the book that kind of got swept under the rug about Fergus's character in the show and don't really get addressed that much. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and we'll put a, a warning at the head of this episode. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so Fergus was being used as a prostitute in the brothel. Like, not all the time, but, like, if somebody requested um, a young boy, uh, Fergus was up. So, um, they definitely, like, brushed that completely under the rug. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, I, I get why they did it, but like, also it's, you know, it kind of is part of what shapes him as, you know, in many ways and makes, helps you, helps us make sense of his character a little bit, knowing that. Um, so it's kind of strange that it's left out and like, and actually like a lot of his life in the brothel is just sort of glossed over in the the show where it's a little more he talks about it a little more in the books Mm -hmm. yeah he does and like there's kind of a slight nod to it i think in season six when Mm -hmm. he's upset over um henri christian being having dwarfism because he knows he because like what he says is something to the effect of like remembering what it's like for children who are very different or unusual and what people like to do to them yeah um and he also learned that sucking a woman's nipples helps her go into labor which he he puts to use in season six as well and you know and if that doesn't just tell you that children's minds are a sponge nothing should (laughs) <laughs> oh god um Fergus. one one thing that i need to call out and i'm just gonna go there it, it, mm-hmm. this line has always bothered me um but like there's this whole like little quick cat and mouse thing between jamie and fergus and Jamie's like not revealing his true intentions. Um, and it actually starts to sound like if you're Fergus, like it starts to sound a little rapey. It does. Like he's like, he's like, I I don't want that. I want you. And then Fergus is like, I'm no whore. And Jamie's like, no, not for that. I want you to be a thief. But I'm like, is that really like, and it's supposed to be funny, right? Like that. Fergus yeah. thought this grown man wanted to be, you know, take 
to abuse him and then ha ha that's not what's going to happen like it it's supposed to be this like cute moment kind of and it's like like the vibes are way off like that is Once why again. is that why is that okay that it's a joke like i just ugh. this shit keeps happening like when jamie's beating claire it's supposed to be funny or right. when Angus crosses the line and kissing uh, kissing Claire goodbye at the end of 116. It's supposed to be funny. These things aren't really funny. Jamie's not an idiot, even though he's playing the part of Laird Dumbass right now. He's actually not an <laughs> idiot. He's fairly worldly. He knows he should be able to guess what kind of stuff a child who works at a brothel is experiencing. Oh, and maybe knows. and maybe lead with I know you're a thief and that's what I'm talking about. Like maybe lead with that. I will say turning him upside down and shaking him was really funny though. Oh, that's that was fun. <laughs> yeah. No, that's but like that's <laughs> funny. And like what let's stick with that. <laughs> it was probably not funny to Fergus, who's just being manhandled by this <laughs> gigantic Highland brute, but now it's <laughs> It is funny. <laughs> Shakes oh, him until man. crap falls out of his pockets. It was excellent. <laughs> where was all that stuff? I where where was all of that stuff on his person? That's what I want to know. I don't know. Cause oh god, cause he made it rain. <laughs> all the coins, and then he's like, and there's Sonny. What is he, and then he's like, he calls him like a wee something. Wee when, I guess a wee bastard yeah, a wee or bastard wee thief or some, something. That's also not a term of endearment, dude. Yes. <laughs> well, he's still in the phase of like, don't bring that thing home. We, I don't want to, you know, who's right. going to feed it and take responsibility for it, right? He's, yeah, Fergus he's is still a, the mutt. It doesn't take Jamie long, but, but actually, um, what I always find interesting is that show Claire is much more affectionate with Fergus than book Claire. Yes. Like book Claire yeah. never really quite acts, you know, as motherly and stuff. She's always kind of like, he's Jamie's like, it's really weird actually. <laughs> So I think, and maybe this is a point counterpoint for a later episode, but Claire has never really struck me as being super maternal. To be honest, like she has her moments, everybody does, but she's not really struck me as being quite like that, especially not the way, well, I don't want to, I'm just going to call him. I'm going to say that Jamie is a, a mother duck. So especially not like Jamie is maternal collecting all of these ducklings that yeah. are his or not. Like she, anyway, we can talk about it another time, I guess. But yeah, it's always, that always has struck me as being kind of a one-sided relationship in the books. How much Fergus really adores Claire yeah. and she loves him. I'm not trying to say that she doesn't love him and doesn't think of him as her son, but she didn't raise him. She didn't bring him home. She didn't birth him. There was all kinds of stuff that just she has been separated from. And you're right. It is really apparent in the in the books. Yeah. It's she's when I picture like how she's maternal, like she's like Alec Baldwin with the broom patting Tina Fey. Like they're there. <laughs> they're there. Which I I relate to because I'm a little like that sometimes too, you know? Yeah. Um <laughs> I'm like, you're old enough to clean the, the toilet after you puke, kid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, yeah, it's it's kind of weird. Um, yeah, I think she I think she grows to think of Fergus more of a son after she comes back. I think she does, too. Um, so she has time to actually act like his like his mother. Yeah. But yeah, Fergus. Yay. And. And I just love these little, he's like just the best little moments of levity, like throughout yeah. this season. And also 
what I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, but Roman Baru is my best guess. The, the, well, he's 21 now. Holy crap. He's not a kid anymore. But the, the young man who plays Fergus in the early seasons is just cute as a button. Oh, I know. Oh, he's the cutest kid. I can't even. Just cute as a button. And he was just perfect for that role. Like, yes. I mean, perfect for it. And uh, Cesar is as well. And I think that's how he says it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Cesar. But um, he's perfect for older Fergus, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, just both roles really, really well cast. Really just make the character come to life. Oh, absolutely. I've, we said it before. We can say it again. There is no bad casting decision in this series. No, There's no, really not. You're right. They are all excellent. And it's, and it's funny because I spent so much time, like way more time in headspace than I want to admit worrying about the casting of Willie. And I know that we like older Willie and I know we haven't actually seen him in action but like the minute they announced um that uh charles vandervart was gonna play him and i i saw the picture i was like oh thank god oh, oh he's thank perfect. god i like, can't wait they did it they did it and i i don't know why i was so worried because you're right they really well i can think of one that i would probably have made differently but i won't go there right now <laughs> But yeah, generally, yeah, very good. Very good. So I don't know if this is going to actually be much of a point counterpoint, but remember last season when I said every season there's a thing Claire does that just pisses me off? Here we are. This one? (laughs) Just, no, so many things. But like, she's so selfish this season. And it drove me absolutely freaking batty this, this episode. I wanted to shake her. Like, I'm just, I'm all, it's episode three in the season. And I'm, maybe I'm still pissed at her for to ransom a man's soul. Maybe I'm still pissed. I don't know. But she's so selfish. So like this argument when, that she has with Jamie, when she comes home late from the hospital. Yeah, it's shitty. Jamie's kind of shitty to her, but he has a point. Well, I mean, he does. And if she had waited and talked to him and, and, you know, if he had been, able to talk to her about it with like um you know at a better time like i may they might have had a better outcome but like he does have a point and you know she's like oh oh okay now i gotta talk about a pet peeve so (laughs) claire is always saying like here she said like i'll only um treat the injured and not the diseased unless it's something i know i can't get but like she is like like it's very bold of her to think that her smallpox vaccine and whatever is right. really going to protect her because those vaccines also depend on herd immunity so we all know now, hopefully, after, you know, uh-huh. all we've been through in the last couple of years that no vaccine is 100% effective. What makes it effective is when enough people are vaccinated and then nobody's passing it around at all. So she's got the small packs vaccine, but like, what does that mean when literally nobody else does? So she thinks she's just like invincible against these diseases. And I mean, she doesn't know. and. These are older versions of these diseases. I mean, we mm-hmm. know that shit mutates too. So, and then I know in the books, there's this like kind of like, and it might even be after she goes back, but there's a, this kind of like cockamamie, like thing. She, she never got sick. That, she never got sick because her immune system was just like so far evolved past what was in the past. But it's like, that doesn't really even make sense either it didn't. because it, it just, it doesn't make any sense because if she's, if she is immune from like certain more modern illnesses, but if the illness is so much more different in the past, then 
why would that make her immune to it? It doesn't make any fucking sense. Blue light special. Yeah, there Can you we go. go with that? Yeah, see there, there's the blue light special theory. But in, anyway, so to to Jamie's point, yeah, she so she went to volunteer at the hospital. If she had talked to him first and been like, "Hey, I kind of want to do this thing," he probably would have been supportive, even if he's a little jealous that she gets to do things she wants to do because he be, for her. Because she has encouraged it, asked it, demanded it of him. He has, he's throwing all of his morals and values out the window for this stupid scheme. And it is eating him alive. Like that's yeah, exactly. the part. I think that's where Lair Dumbass comes into day, comes into play on this episode. So like in Lally Brock, it was a lot of guilt that he wasn't like, he was just self-flagellating through the entire freaking episode over not being there um, to protect Jenny and not being there. So that they had to, you know, pay the watch, all that, you know, shit that he just can't let go of because he refuses to process. Anywho. <laughs> and now he's Laird dumbass because he's doing this shit for Claire and it's killing him. It's eating him alive. He's lying to nuns now, for fuck's sake. Right? Seriously. Well, he didn't technically lie to the nun. It was a lie of omission and he knows that what that is. It was. <laughs> <laughs> lying to nuns terrible catholic what is he doing so yeah so he I, I i really side with jamie like did he word all that correctly did he maybe could he maybe have been less ragey about how he had this conversation with claire yes ragey and pouty and pouty <laughs> was he going like was he capable of it at who knows what time o'clock when he's just like been stressing and stewing and doesn't have anything else to think about other than how pissed off he is like no he probably was not i mean his frontal lobe is not quite developed he's still working on it yes the traumatic brain injury plus the traumatic brain injury and the actual like the the emotional trauma and the other physical yeah. trauma and it's just, it's just a lot it's a lot on his plate right now and Claire's like, I was lancing boils. He's like, the fuck, bitch? Why? <laughs> because she could be helping. Like, there are things she could be doing. And I think that's where he was trying to get out with, like, go have tea with Louise and stuff. Right. But she could be climbing the social ladder. She could be hanging out with Master Raymond and getting more information. Like, there are things she could be doing, too. She could also be working that side of the system. Yeah, and I mean, I think she is a little bit, like, she is, does go and hang out with Louise a lot and stuff. Um, but yeah, and I just, I think they're just both being, like you said earlier, Laird and Lady Dumbass. Mm -hmm. So, you know, neither of them, and they're not communicating at all. Like, this whole first part of season two is just, like, could be subtitled, like, lack of communication gets you oh, into yeah. bad stuff like yeah it's just stonewall city you know in, in deceptions like you know some of the deception is between the two of them in different ways like she's yeah. she's keeping a secret from him um and i mean he's not he's not keeping a secret from her but as we find out in an episode or two he is very much bottling up his feelings um mm -hmm. about what yeah. happened and I just think they're both being dumbasses. Like, you know, she she could have read the room a little better mm -hmm. when she got home. Like the episode before, they're not in Scotland anymore. It's different. Nice callback. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, <laughs> and um, it's one thing for Claire to be a healer kind of you know traveling with the Mackenzies, right mm -hmm. but like jamie's really never considered i don't think what it means for her to be a healer outside of that like social group so i think point. it probably is shocking as hell to him especially because she's pregnant that you know she, he he doesn't know he, he all he knows is that these are like the poorest of the poor people and that there's like pestilence and disease everywhere so it's going to take him a minute 
to get used to that. And I think that's okay. But, you know, he could have handled himself better, but so could she. Yeah. So they're just, I think they're just both being idiots. There's your point. Counterpoint. There, so no counterpoint. I, I also find it very selfish of her to not tell Jamie that she knows Jack Randall is alive because that's the only thing that is letting him sleep at night at all is yeah. reassuring himself that his abuser is dead. And now she's got to take that away from him. And she's been hanging on to this for a long fucking time. And that shit don't smell better with age. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and I think it's eating her up, but she is rightfully worried about what that will do to him to know that he's alive. And she and Myrta even talk about it. And I think they're both worried that he will just haul off to Scotland and just try to, or wherever BJR is right now and try to kill and just kill him. And then, and then where would, would everybody be at that point? Right. So, I mean, there is some selfishness in it, but I think it's also that she is worried genuinely about his reaction. I also think though, that she's worried about his reaction and how it's going to affect Frank, not how it's going to affect Jamie which yes you know i'm not even gonna say i was gonna say fair no it's not it's not fair because this is the allegiance that she chose she chose to stay with him and i'm not saying that means that frank should eat shit and die because i kind of like frank but at the same time like that's her that's her flimsy excuse that's gonna sound real good that's gonna sound real good to the man you said you were gonna stay with because you loved him and that he's your soulmate Okay. Yeah, I mean, and we'll see that play out in one of the future episodes yeah. that's coming up very soon. Again, I never know what happens in which episode, so I'm not sure which we'll one. We'll be but... surprised. We'll find out together. <laughs> so the thing that I wanted to bring up for John, because this kind of, kind of sort of relates to the the shitty argument that Laird and Lady Dumbass had about her being at the hospital and volunteering. When... John and Claire got married. He gifted her a medicine kit, a medicine box. Mm. Fully stocked, just automatically assumed like, this is who you are. This is what makes you happy. I think this is the best thing that I can do to help you heal is to give you something to be useful. Unfortunately, she stares at it and thinks about all the ways she can kill herself with what's, with what's inside. But um, he tried. Like, he did the right thing there. <laughs> Now, on the show, Jamie also gets her a medicine box. It's the Dr. Rawlings yeah. medicine box. I can't remember in the book if he so. gets it for her or if it, she just buys it. But, yeah. So, I it, it I, it, it's kind of nice, too. Like, because he, in, like, when she, in later season three and in early season four, after she comes back, like, Jamie has definitely become more accepting of just like okay this is who claire is and there's nothing i can do about it um so i might as well help her out right and then and then yeah by the time she gets to john i mean john's just he knows what's up and he has learned from his going through his life that he is not going to stand in the way (laughs) of (laughs) A strong-headed woman like Claire, like his mother, like his sister-in-law, like uh-huh. no, no. So he's 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 learned, you know, from from observation, and uh, yeah, and he it is so such a sweet gesture. I love that scene because it's like Willie calling her like Mother Claire, and uh-huh. John with oh, that melts my fucking heart every time. We better get Mother Claire in season yes seven anyway right. since we're on this i'm gonna ramble just a tiny tiny bit i love in not echo the one after it book eight i can never get keep the title straight anywho written in my own heart but thank you that book eight when willie realizes that jamie is his father and he's having his angsty meltdown i do like how he's going through all of the people who lied to him and how he's got to come up with like new ways to fit everyone into his life in his mind and all of this stuff. And then he gets to mother Claire and well, no, I guess that's still the same. Well, and talk about what... it right at the end of echo. 
I think mm-hmm. he even says that I'm to her. One. I can't. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it is when they see each other and again in. I can't remember, but they talk about it, and he says like. Starts. He starts calling her Mistress Fraser or something again, and she's like, she's like, can't you? I don't, I don't even remember, but well, I'd have to go look for, it up. But yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. about it. They talk about it. Yeah. And it's very sweet it. because, and she, you know, we were just talking about um, her maternal instincts with Willie, even though he's like grown up by the time she comes into his life, um, we get to see her being a little maternal with him when he gets like hurt and stuff. And it's very sweet. She has a very soft spot for him, which is just she adorable. Does. It's interesting that her, our, we see her as being so maternal when she's got grown children. Yeah. Yeah. We never get to see really. There's a few scenes in the books. There's a little bit in the books more with her when Brianna was little, but not a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it's all like, it's all like told through older Claire's perspective you know what i mean it's not like it's not like they show it in real time yeah so something else that doesn't make sense about this episode why in the hell are they openly talking about their plot in front of jared's servants well it's why like in the in the for in the earlier episode before they said they made sure to mention that jared had chosen his servants well and they were like of the utmost discretion or whatever. Um, that that's that would no no. I feel like they oh, sorry. Okay, so what that sounds to me like is the servants. It's okay if the servants know that Jared's a Jacobite because they know and they're well compensated and they're not going to like sell information. Is that going right. to translate in their favor when he comes home? Like, why? Are they talking about this plot in front of the servants? I, the whole time. I was just like, why are they doing this? Shut up. Well, and it's kind of gross if you think about it. Because, like, it just kind of shows how they, like, don't even consider the presence of the servants. Yeah. It's like, really weird. And it's different. I, I'm not comparing the two at all. But, like, it makes me think of, like like stuff from like uh the antebellum south and like during slavery and stuff yeah. when they would they just would talk pretty openly about stuff in front of the slaves cuz they didn't even really view them as human. Obviously yeah. this is not the same thing but you know it's like wow the help is invisible. Oh, yeah, it's annoying. That's why I like Downton Abbey cuz they are not invisible. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Yeah, so that didn't make sense, 100%. And also, so I think this is because I just watched Versailles, so the show Versailles. So I was like, you know, I know that Versailles isn't like super far far from Paris, but it's definitely like not just like a hop, skip, and a jump away. So I looked it up today, and I'm like, it's like 13 miles and I can't remember the kilometers for our non-American listeners, I'm sorry, from Paris to Versailles. And then I'm like, so how long would that be by carriage? And it's really hard to find this information. Like I've had to look up (laughs) shit like this for other stories I've done. And it's like really hard. Like you'd think like somebody just needs to build like a calculator, right? Like just a simple calculator for for, for people who like write and stuff, so they know this That's shit. But anyway, a good idea, right? Okay. Like just now like do it. Thir- thirteen miles equals you know how many hours by horse, by horse drawn carriage, by wagon, whatever. But anyway, I can do that next. So shit. Oh, nice. Um, but anyway, I calculated that it would take approximately three to six hours. And three is like, I'm guessing that wouldn't be the norm because when you think about how shitty the roads were. So, yeah. So we're talking like significant trips. And he's making these like two times a day. 
Like, what? Three hours to go 13 miles is booking it in a carriage. Yeah, yeah. That's, like, the high end. Because it said, like, they can go, like, two to four miles per hour or something like that. So, yeah, I was just like, this this doesn't, like, he's there's no way he'd be traveling back and forth to Versailles, like, in the same day and doing, mm-hmm. like, other stuff, too. Like, it just <laughs> does not make sense. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. I'm like, come on, people. Well, but that just makes me think of um, bees and how William was like up and down the entire East Coast like five <laughs> times in that book. <laughs> that kid, that poor kid, has gotten lost so many times. It's like every time we see him, he's like he's lost again. Holy shit. He walks a lot. He rides a lot of horses. Did he go all the way up to New York at one point? I think uh-huh. so. And then, because did he go with Ian? I can't remember. But anyway, he went up to New York. He came back. And then they're like, oh, got to go to Philadelphia. And he's like, okay. And I'm just... <laughs> After getting lost in the dismal, he, in, in Bees, though, it was like he went to Lynchburg, met up with John Cinnamon. And then, like, they rode to Savannah, where Lord right. John was. <laughs> that's not, like, a day trip. Even today, that's not a day trip. No. I mean, and again, for our non... I know sometimes, um, especially people that live in, like, Europe and stuff, it's just kind of a weird concept to think about, like the distance far, yeah. in the u.s and how far things are but yeah these are not like yeah like that's not even a day trip by car so like <laughs> i'm looking up to yeah. see how far it is from lynchburg to savannah it is 435 miles come on calculator and if they were on horse they were on horseback 435 miles they could probably travel 30 miles a day because they're experienced riders that's two weeks right right or more <laughs> each way it's just a hop skip and a jump you know he gets it from john do they have calluses on their ass that just seems like a long time to be sitting in a saddle like that makes I my mean, thighs hurt just thinking about it he grew up with his papa like you know stopping in North Carolina on the way to Virginia. On the way. (laughs) John, I was just in the neighborhood gray. Um, (laughs) Hop over to Virginia uh, from London to the Lake District. Oh, God. These grays, they stress me out. And yes, I am calling William a gray because he is. He is a gray as much as he's a Fraser. So what do you think should be our non-canon ship of the week? I'm going to go with Claire Louise. I think I've talked about this before, but like, I always like to think of Louise as a like nice alternative to Claire Galis. Um, And I won't go into all that again, but I, you know, I, I get a vibe. Like I got a little bit of a vibe last episode, you know, when Claire was watching her get, get her, uh, uh, muffin sheared or whatever. <laughs> her beaver depelted her muffin <laughs> sheared that makes no fucking sense um <laughs> you know and she was kind of like at first she was like cringing and then she was like hmm like okay you I'm know try that so i, I think louise would they would really uh they could tear shit up a little <laughs> Louise is growing on me on the rewatch. I found her so annoying the first time through. Like, she just, I didn't like, I didn't care for her at all. I just found her annoying. Not like evil, like Gayless, but annoying. Yeah, she is annoying. And I mean, she really bullies poor Mary. Like, she does. <laughs> give, give the kid a break. She's 15. But anyway, yeah, so, yeah, I like Louise. I mean, Claire says she's a good friend, and she does prove to be a good friend later on. Um, and you, it's it's not till a few episodes yeah. where, where you really start to see what Claire sees in her as a friend. 
which in the book, it's a little more, I think their friendship is a little more well formed in the beginning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like Louise. She's, she's annoying, but you know, she's like that annoying friend that's like kind of annoying, but really sweet and like has all these connections. So it's just like, you just kind of put up with the annoying part. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that sums it up. So, um, did you have a fic that you put on the Dead on Arrival list this week? I did. Um, and this is, it's silly. So I was scrolling through, I don't TikTok, but I YouTube shorts, which is just the same thing. And there yeah. is a guy who posts these like cooking videos. And I'm not going to say who it is because this is directly related to the DOA fic, but he made this, he's like Italian and he does it. He's rather attractive kind of buff does everything shirtless which is the whole reason i watch it (laughs) not gonna lie um because he's really he's really obnoxious very young anyway he made a dish with penis shaped pasta and white sauce (laughs) and i shared this video with a couple of friends and i was like hey in case you need like lunch ideas here's an idea for <laughs> for you and these are fandom friends and one of them says oh like john's kitchen i'm like oh shit here we go because now i'm having thoughts that this is like some awful like modern au midlife crisis grinder hookup and it's just going so <laughs> badly <laughs> oh god so that was it it's, i'm not going to write that one but uh that- that makes me think of one that I never wrote. It's not a new one that I never wrote, but um, I used to envision doing like a like a birdcage kind of modern AU with like John and Jamie and Willie <laughs> and and Tom Bird is uh, Spart. What's the book? What's the servant's name? Atticus Spartacus or something. <laughs> something like that um and like you just made me think of that because of the penis shaped pasta because in the movie they have the The like she's like she's like oh are these men playing leapfrog (laughs) i adore that movie so much oh my god i love it i love it that would be like perfect, right? Like, but I, I I never wrote it. So if anyone wants like that movie and um wants to write that, go right ahead. You have my uh stamp of approval. A birdcage fusion fic. That would be fan. Oh my god, <laughs> that would be fantastic. Agador is yes. the name. Agador, not Atticus. Agador. But I'm pretty sure they call him Agador Spartacus, right? Yeah, he insists on being called by his full name. <laughs> I do not wear shoes. They make me fold out. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, God, I love it. And then you you would get to have, like, Jamie and John as, like, older, mature men, like, just kind of living their best life. Oh, God. Yeah, that would be perfect. That would be so perfect. <laughs> I need to watch that movie again. Oh, God. So, Fick Wreck this week. Um, this week, we are recommending A Token of Appreciation by Levy Squeaks. This is kind of a thank you since he couldn't join us today this week. This is a special story to me because it was one that he wrote for my birthday. And it's just a short little um, Fergus-centric story where he gives Jamie a pocket watch for his birthday. Oh, It's very cute. That sounds... I think I may have read that now that you mentioned that. That's cute. cute. It's, it's short and sweet. So we will link that on social media. Please go give it some love. It's definitely worth it. Um, so we do have, we don't have a, any mail yet, but we did have another Tumblr comment, um, that we, that we would, we want to talk about a little bit. Um, and it kind of is a good timing, I think, cause we were just talking about 
Fergus's history and, you know, mm -hmm. all of that too. But um, so a, one of the Tumblr commenters um, said, you know, pointed out, oh my God, my dogs are snoring. I don't know if that's picking that up. I can't anyway. hear them. <laughs> I'm like, what is that sound? It's snoring. Okay. That John is also a sexual assault survivor. Um, and people who watch the show only or haven't even read the Lord John books probably wouldn't know that. But it, and it says, in fact, DG pays a nod to this in John's sexual encounters, particularly when he faces the chimney piece when having sex with Percy, which is in Brotherhood of the Blade. Um, I must say the Phantom brushes past this quite a lot. And I would say that I think unless you've read, a lot of the Phantom hasn't read the Lord John books. So if you haven't read the Lord John books, you wouldn't know this about him. Yeah. It's not, he doesn't, like even in his internal monologue, he doesn't talk about it enough or much, not enough. He doesn't talk about it very much. Doesn't think about it very much. It comes up a few times. There right. is um, like he, he's with the Hanoverian troops in, was that brotherhood too? And he I sees, so. yeah, he sees one of the Hanoverian privates as being made fun of, bullied, teased, whatever for being gay but it's like a joke, but he can see, John can see by looking at, at this young soldier that it's hitting home, that it's true. So John kind of jumps in is like, you have to laugh or they're going to know. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then that's, that's where the reveal is for the reader that he knows what happens when cruel people, even your brothers in arms find out that you're gay. Th this commenter is correct that we do kind of tend to to brush past this a lot we don't really it doesn't come up very much i've seen it a few times not a whole heck of a lot it's just one of those like difficult things to approach mm -hmm. i think um i would like however to point out that it's really not specifically it's really not specifically stated in the books that John prefers to top because of his sexual assault survival experience because he's been sexually assaulted. Um, and that would also be kind of a shitty assumption to make. Like that may be the case. It could be a trust thing. He does say that though in Brotherhood of the Blade. And I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying like yeah. in Brotherhood of the Blade, he does like Percy wants to top John in um John kind of gets lost in his thoughts a little bit about why he doesn't normally yeah. like to and it's because of that but you're right that like that's and and that's just pure Diana just like yeah. again just not understanding male sexual assault or sexual assault in general mm -hmm. um so she's just like making these kind of wild assumptions about about um gay men and their experiences with that and just assuming that like if a guy had been raped he would not like to be topped and I, that's just so fucking stupid because again yeah you you know when you talk about this stuff like you know does that mean a woman never like to you know be penetrated again if she's been raped like that's just it's so fucking dumb yeah and sometimes though that i mean sometimes that does occur that is sure. that's a Absolutely. normal normal course of the trauma and the healing normal response it's not the only response it's not necessarily one that people who experience it are going to be necessarily comfortable with that response like there's there's all there's everyone is different everyone's right. everyone's journey is completely different and there's no right or wrong way to live through this. People will have all different reactions to it. But the fact that she chose this one and then brought it up in this context. Yeah. And in, in knowing everything else I know about her <laughs> makes me think that this is just what she thinks. Like, yeah, you know, and, you know. 
some guys just prefer to bottom. Some guys just prefer to top. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And sexual assault doesn't have to have anything to do with it. Just, you know, wow. What a concept. That yeah. people's sexual uh, lives can be shaped by something other than sexual assault. It can <laughs> just be your preference. It's you okay. Know? I read once in some article about how there's definitely like a, amongst some men in the gay community where it kind of becomes this like hierarchy, weird thing, like in then like, like bottoms are like seen as like the more effeminate and like whatever. And it just becomes this weird like way for, you know, that people separate themselves out too. And I'm just like, yeah, the, the stereotypes. Well, that's, that's why right. I don't, it, that that's, you know, that's why top bottom discourse and fandom is just not helpful. Yeah. I just, um, it's just weird to me. And I, I never, I never thought about that because obviously yeah. I am, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but I am not a gay man. So, or a man who likes to have sex with other men in general. So, and I'm not in that community. So I've just, the thought never occurred to me that there would yeah. be that like kind of weird stereotyping and hierarchy that can be pretty damaging. Yeah. Bringing it back to John and Percy though, he was very surprised that he liked it and it scared him. Yeah. I need to reread that book again so we can unpack that. Does he also let Stefan top to top him? Yes, too? he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> Which I think anybody would be a little nervous about. <laughs> sure does. So, you know, <sighs> it just takes trust for him is basically what it boils down to. And again, that doesn't have to be anything about being a sexual assault survivor. Like, it really doesn't. See, now I'm thinking about Stefan. And that's where my brain's going to be for the rest of the evening. I mean, I think that John, of all the men, you know, because their friendship has been gone on for so long and mm -hmm. it's, it's very much like Jamie, like John really very much trusts Stefan and, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there you go. I would love to spend time really talking about him more, but, uh, yeah, I think we have probably beat this episode. <laughs> like a drum <laughs> this is gonna be like the one of the most boring episodes of the podcast i think we're just it like didn't feel fun what do we talk about this episode I'm sorry gonna... everyone we tried okay so here we go it is entirely possible so interview with the vampire just came out and i watched it the other day have you seen it yet no i haven't watched it yet i have to do that i it's on it's on AMC, right? Yep. Um okay. one million out of ten, no notes. I'm in gay vampire heaven. It is fucking amazing. And like nothing is ever going <laughs> nothing is ever gonna be as good as this the show. I was I had to pause this thing like four times to lose my shit and then settle back oh. down. It is freaking phenomenal. And then like to go from that where every shot is just the writing oh the writing on that show beth i i could never but i want to it's so good the dialogue is just perfect the scenery is beautiful and every single shot is just filled with tension and emotion and excitement and it's and like anticipation and seduction and then i'm watching fucking this episode of outlander which is nothing <laughs> And I'm Laird so and lady dumbass. It is Laird and Lady Dumbass, and I'm so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if you and I talked about um the show True Blood before. I no, we haven't talked about True Blood. I used to watch True Blood. Okay. So I was watching um 
my show 911 Lone Star and I mm-hmm. now I'm making my husband watch it with me because that's what I do. I force him to watch my favorite shows with me against his will. Um, so there's this character on there and he always looked really familiar to me, but like I just didn't I just didn't really think to look him up or whatever. And my husband's like, he looks so familiar. And I'm like, you know, you're right. I gotta look him up. So I look him up. He's he was Hoyt Fortenberry. I've seen him in like gifs and stuff on Tumblr that he's in that. I'm like, you're gonna say Hoyt. <laughs> yes. And I was like, oh my God. I'm so excited because I loved that show. Oh my God. This is now a vampire show. It, my fucking Tumblr, if you follow me, I'm sorry. Um, my Tumblr is 100 percent just interview with the vampire spoilers right now. <laughs> and well, mine is just 911 Lone Star, so I mean it's no better. My cue. I I was I'm going I was going through my I was going through the, the gifs and everything when I saw that it when I saw that the episode dropped online early, I'm like, well, I guess I'm getting an AMC subscription tonight. And I did. And it's just <laughs> me and a bottle of wine, and oh, I'm so good. <laughs> so that's nice. that's now my I've made that my whole personality, and I'm not going to apologize. You're welcome. The gifs are tasty. I'm gonna watch that tonight. Now I think after we uh, stop recording, feel free to scream at me on Discord. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think we should probably wrap up Lord John Lander because this is we are still technically here. <laughs> thank you everyone for listening it's always a pleasure even when we're talking about boring shit i hope you found something that entertained you or at least kept you occupied while you did something terrible like scrubbing toilets or washing dishes or something (laughs) this is definitely a scrubbing toilets episode uh Uh, for sure (laughs) all right thanks everyone we will talk to you next week bye bye If you're listening to this, it means you survived another episode of Lord John Lander. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter or Tumblr at Lord John Lander or on our website at lordjohnlander.wordpress.com slash contact us. All opinions expressed on the Lord John Lander podcast belong to us and are not affiliated with Outlander, Sony, Stars, and definitely 100% not with Diana Gabaldon. This podcast is not suitable for children, immature adults, homophobes, anyone who takes fandom seriously, people who don't understand that the characters aren't real, people with sticks up their ass, people who hate fun, and people with no sense of humor. Do not try any of these hot takes at home. We are professionals. And if you know us in real life, no you don't.